just a few more minutes, see if we can get a little more hands. There were a few car crashes, so that might make it a little slower. Morning, Eric. How are you? We'll wait just a few more minutes. Morning, me, Bobby. Have a good break yesterday. That's kind of nice. Are you working? Yeah, I was at the rec desk in the morning and then life starting at night. So. I had one team yesterday. Baseball or? Baseball. Okay. Was basketball in there after you? Mm hmm. Oh. That's my assistant right there. Oh, got it. Well, Brian. Finally, I'll give it a couple more minutes. others at the track meet too. Mm -hmm. And Callie and Abby. <clears throat> well we will be doing some calculations today. Got a sheet of paper and we'll get that started. Yeah. Perfect. We're almost next week. Thank you. Okay. You just take a picture of it. Welcome. Uh, just want to uh, give you an idea of where we're at uh, today and going forward. So uh, we will finish up chapter four today and then we'll get into the first part of chapter five, introduction. Uh, we do have uh, an exam coming up next week before spring break, so uh, that will be on Thursday uh, over chapters three and four. Uh, there is a study guide posted already for exam two, so you can access that. Um, so if you go to the home page and you uh, go to study guides, uh, you'll see the very first file.
for that. Uh, so um, we'll get into a lot more of chapter five on, on Thursday, but uh, just finishing up chapter four and introducing chapter five for today. Okay, so we last left off talking about work, energy, and power. How do we define energy? Energy and work are interrelated. How do we define? Yeah, energy is the capacity to do work, and then how do we define energy? Energy is the capacity to do work. How do we define work? Work is yes. How we calculate it. Um, uh, work is defined as energy expression through a body or object. So work is defined as energy expression. Uh, energy is defined as the capacity uh, to do work. Uh, so uh, we talked about different types of energy, different types of mechanical energy. And what were the two types of potential energy? So we have energy. Yes, gravitational and strain. So energy due to height above a, a defined surface, and then energy due to deformation, so a change in shape of a body or object. So in the body, we have tendons that undergo deformation as they stretch and then recoil during muscle contraction. Uh, so what are the units to express work and energy? Yes, joules. Okay. All right. So speaking of tendons, uh, let's talk about the stretch shortened cycle. Okay, the stretch shortened cycle. Stretch shortened cycle involves a coupling. Coupling. Two things that occur together. Coupling of muscle actions. And so we have eccentric actions that are followed by concentric actions. So stretch shortened cycle allows us to use the elastic properties of muscle, which makes movement more efficient. Stretching tendons and then tendons return that energy into the force production. And so that's energy efficient, requires fewer expenditure of calories. So looking at the coupling of muscle actions, eccentric to concentric, we can think about it in several different ways. So during a stretch, a tendon uh, will undergo a change in length. So a deformation, a tendon like a, like a elastic band is undergoing a stretch. And during the subsequent uh, contraction, the tendon recoils and that allows more force into the movement. So it adds force to the contractile component of muscle. So if you've had exercise physiology, you know that muscles have tiny proteins that bind together to create force. The elasticity augments that force. So it augments the contractile component to create greater force. So in, in uh, the first lab that we did in this class, we compared counter movement jumps to squat jumps. And many of you experienced a higher jump height in a counter movement jump versus a squat jump. And so how did you account for that in your essay? What was the rationale behind that, mechanically speaking? So what are you getting in the counter movement because it allows a higher jump versus just a squat jump. Mm -hmm. Elasticity, so it's, it's a stretch shortened cycle. So the counter movement, uh, you're undergoing a, a stretch uh, in a brief squat uh, prior to takeoff. And so that increases the height of the jump versus a squat jump, what are you doing? You're just coming down and you have no, you have no pre-stretch. You have no load phase. And so you're, you're squatting down and then holding that position statically. 
and then just using the contractile components of muscle to push your body off the ground. And so uh, with a counter movement, you're taking advantage of the stretch shortened cycle. And so during the stretch part, that's where you're storing energy, storing energy. So storing this potential energy that we can use as a muscle releases uh, into a movement. So the energy that we store can then be released and expressed as kinetic energy while conveyed. So energy due to movement. Okay, so we look at high speed eccentric type actions. So in lab number two, uh, we practice depth jumps. Depth jumps, you're stepping off of a box, allowing gravity to accelerate your body into the ground. So your feet, con your feet contact the ground and your muscles undergo a very high speed eccentric type action. High speed eccentric action. So your feet contact the ground and your muscles are trying to bring your body to a stop. So it's like slamming on the brakes. So your muscles are slamming on the brakes and attempting to reverse that into a jump. So it's a high speed eccentric action. We're decelerating and then reversing that action into a high speed concentric action. We're lifting our body off the ground. So again, jump. Landing would be part of the stretch. Jump takeoff would be part of the part of the shorten. So that's why we call it a cycle, because you have two things that occur one right after the other. You have the stretch, where all of these things are taking place. So it's about storage, it's about deceleration, it's about preparing for what comes next. And then you have the subsequent shortened phase where you have all of these things that are taking place. So the conversion of, of potential energy, this elasticity into uh, kinetic energy. So energy doesn't, uh, we don't create it, it just changes forms. So in, in the stretch part, it's potential and then we, it changes forms into kinetic as we jump. So the middle part of this is really important. We also alluded to this in lab. Do you remember the term between the stretch and the shorten? I'll bet somebody does. The brief interval of time between the end of the stretch or the end of the preparatory phase, just before you start into the acceleration phase or the, the shortened phase. So as soon as I put that up there, you're going to it's amortization. So you should should ring a bell, amortization. So very important that we have a short amortization phase uh, in order to use all of that potential energy, that potential elasticity. Uh, the transition between the stretch and the shorten has to be very brief. There's a learning curve associated with that. So we can get better with practice at shortening the phase, the time interval between the stretch and the shorten. So that, that can come with practice. So think about it, with, with a counter movement jump, if the time interval between when the counter movement ends and when the jump begins is excessively long, all of that Elasticity dissipates as heat energy. So it, it, rather than transitioning into the jump and contributing to the jump, it's going to dissipate as heat, heat energy. So in order to use more of this elasticity and putting it into the jump, we have to make sure we're shortening the amortization. So from the Flanagan article, uh, there was discussion about uh, slow stretch shorten cycle exercises and fast stretch shorten cycle exercises. 
So there's a progression involved. So initially you would want to program uh, slower stretch shorten cycle exercises. So people are getting used to transitioning from the preparatory phase or the sometimes it's called the load phase. Maybe some of you have heard that. This is the load phase where you're loading a muscle in a tendon prior to the jump. So you'd program slow stretch shorten cycle exercises where I think the figure in that Flanagan said was uh, where the amortization is greater than 250 milliseconds. And then eventually you would progress to fast uh, stretch shortened cycle where uh, the ground contact is very short. So sometimes the amortization can be likened to uh, ground contact where the amortization is less than 250 milliseconds. So I, I think um, one of the exercises uh, that involves a fast stretch shortened cycle would be multiple hurdle hops. So getting a series of hurdles together and then progressively jumping over each one and trying to minimize uh, the ground contact time between jumps. So getting down and quickly getting off the ground. Sometimes the cue uh, given is the ground is hot. If any of you have heard that. So that prompting an athlete to quickly touch down and then get into the next uh, jump. So do you have any questions about the stretch shortened cycle? To understand what's going on from uh, one part to the other. Okay, so um, I have just a, a small video for you. And last week we talked about uh, static stretching and the timing of static stretching. And so we talked about the importance of not including excessive static stretching just prior to an event that requires lots of strength and power. And so based on our discussion, when, when is the best time to include static stretching? Post-workout. Yeah, yeah post-workout period um, is, is the best. Um, so we want our muscles to retain this spring-type quality. So tendons can lose their spring if we do a lot of static stretching just prior to a sprint or a jump. So this video that I'm going to play uh, talks about um, what excessive in the context of static stretching means. So what is excessive just prior to a, a strength and power event? So let me play that. And these are the questions that I'd like you to write down on your paper. On our notes or something. Uh, this will be on the same sheet as your problem, so we'll just turn it all in together. like to add to question one. Um, I'd like to know 
what each of those fibers monitors. And what each of those two fibers in a muscle spindle, and what does each one monitor? It's so they both monitor slightly different things. If you need just a little more time to write those down, okay. We have our lab midterm next week. Uh, that will be in uh, our lab that's downstairs uh, in 134. Uh, the midterm for lab is an open note uh, exam. You can bring all of your notes. Um, so, should be okay. Okay. Stretching the way we think about athletes by Dr. David Payne. First question is, is stretching enhanced by athletic career? Let's be realistic. Number 32 up there, aka me, did not have a spectacular professional football career. In fact, one might say that I had a cup of coffee in the Canadian Football League. So I went to training camp, I played one game, I cut. So why didn't anybody want to pay me to play football? Well, it could be for factors, but one of the main factors, at least in my opinion, was I didn't have that breakaway speed. And you need to have that burning speed to be a good running back. So what are the components of speed? There's two components, stride rate, stride length. Now, stride rate is a frequency at which you can move your legs back and forth. And stride rate is highly dependent upon the percentage of fast twitch fibers you've got in your legs. Now, the percentage of fast twitch fibers you have in your legs is highly dependent upon your genetics. So what did your parents pass on to you? Did you pick the right parents? Right? Unfortunately, I did not pick the right parents. I ended up being slow. Now, the second component is stride length. Fortunately, stride length can be altered by training. So if you work on your explosive strength and your power, you can explode off the ground and cover a greater distance with each stride. So knowing that, when I was a football player, I worked very hard on my strength, and I could squat over 500 pounds. Now there's a notion as well that if you have limited flexibility, that that would hamper your stride length. So based on that notion, I worked really hard on my flexibility. And I could do the splits. Now, I was going to demonstrate tonight, but then I remembered that was 35 years ago. Right. So I worked hard on my strength. I worked hard on my, my flexibility. I still wasn't fast enough to be a professional football player. So where did we get this notion that flexibility or stretching would enhance performance? Well, perhaps it's an evolutionary type of thought. If you take a look at some of the animals, you see that animals stretch. In fact, our top of the food chain, Lottie, our pet Boston Terrier, stretches every morning. Four limbs, hind limbs, and does she think it's going to do anything for her? Does she think that she's going to get out there and she's going to catch that neighborhood rabbit for the first time? I don't think so. Well, maybe we'll look at one of our other ancestors, maybe the early hominids. Did they do extensive static stretching before they went on the hunt? that have allowed them to catch the mastodons better or the mammoths? Or maybe it would have allowed them to run faster away from those saber-toothed tigers. Well, how about the medieval times? Did medieval swordsmen do a lot of static stretching in preparation for battle? We don't know that. But what we do know 
is that in the world wars, it was the first time they started systematic investigations into human performance. And if you go to a fitness facility and the fitness consultant says to you, well, let's get started. We're gonna have you do three sets of 10 repetitions of bench press. And when you finish that, we're gonna get you to come on over here and you're gonna do three sets of 10 repetitions of bicep. You can thank a guy named Colonel Delorme. And Colonel Delorme was in the US Army. He was the first one to take a look at the most efficient ways of promoting strength and endurance. But it wasn't just the US Army. The Royal Canadian Air Force also came up in the late 1950s and early 1960s with the 5BX plan. It was by uh, Dr. Bill Corbin, another Canadian. Now 5BX stood for five basic exercises. And what it was supposed to do was supposed to allow the military personnel to be more fit when they didn't have equipment or facilities to work out. So with the, the 5BX, you probably remember one of those exercises if you've ever seen any of the old movies. You probably saw some of those military personnel standing up there, fingertip to fingertip. And there'd be a sergeant in front, and the sergeant would say, okay, let's get going, and a one, and a two, and a three. And you'd be bouncing up and down. Now what was the purpose of doing that? Well, the purpose was supposed to, to build up your core strength and your trunk strength, and was also supposed to increase the flexibility of your lower limbs. There's a problem, though, with that kind of exercise. And it had to do with what's called your myotatic reflex. Now, your myotatic reflex, if you've ever been to the doctor, and the doctor takes your knee, hits the patellar tendon, and you get that reflex going, when you do that, there's what's called a muscle spindle in your muscle, and it tells you that your muscle is being stretched. It sends a message back to your spinal cord and activates that motor neuron and says, contract that muscle. Well, inside that muscle spindle, there's two components. There's what's called a nuclear bag fiber, and there's a nuclear chain fiber. Now, the nuclear bag fiber tells you the rate at which you're stretching the muscle. So you can imagine when I, where they're going boom, 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 that that's a fast rate. So a high frequency signal goes back to your spinal cord, makes that muscle contract. The nuclear chain fiber, it tells you the extent that you stretch your muscle. So going all the way down to your toe is quite a ways for that muscle, and there's another high frequency signal that comes back to that spinal cord and makes it contract. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to stretch that muscle, and yet the reflexes are trying to contract that muscle. So you've got two opposing forces. That's a recipe for injury. So where did we go from there? Well, what we changed to after the early 1960s is we changed to static stretching. And static stretching became the mainstay of the warm-ups for the next 30 years. So why would we do static stretching? Well, what is static stretching? Well, static stretching would be, instead of bouncing, I would reach forward nice and slowly, and I would hold that stretch. Now, what that does, remember I said the nuclear bag fibers, they sense the rate. If I go slowly and hold it, there's no rate, so the bag fibers don't fire. Remember I talked about the nuclear chain fibers. They tell you the extent. Well, of course, they fired when I first stretched. But if I hold this stretch for 30 or 60 seconds, they turn off too. So now what I've got is I've got a muscle that's starting to relax. And instead of reaching this far, I can reach farther and farther and farther and farther. Not bad for guys almost 60, right? So, Static stretching was a mainstay for 30 years. Now we came to about the late 1990s or the early 2000s. And there's some research coming out by people named Kokonen and Jonathan Fowles from McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. And they started to show that maybe there's impairments in your performance if you do static stretching. So from that time on, there's a multitude of studies that came out during the next 12 years or so. So we published a review study and in that review study, we show that when you take a look at all the studies that were published during that time, you see in the graph that the majority of them provided impairments, impairments to, to force and power. And how much impairments? Well, we found in the studies we looked at, it was about 5%. There's another review that came out after ours by a couple of people named Kay and Lazarus. They were from Australia. Unfortunately, they came out with almost the exact same findings. They said that it was about 7.5% impairments based on the studies they looked at. 
So we're both in the same ballpark, which is kind of nice because we're not contradicting each other. So 5%. Now, if you look at running, running doesn't give you the same picture. The running studies, most of them don't show significant impairments. Why is that? Well, it's because there's all sorts of different kinds of running. You can be sprinting. You can be running a marathon. You can be just jogging for health and fitness. And they're all going to be quite different in the terms of the speed you're going, the power that you're doing, and the time that you're on the ground. So let's say that you are Usain Bolt, and you're sprinting in the Olympics. Well, Usain Bolt is like a high-performance machine. And in fact, you might want to cons compare him to a Ferrari. Okay? A Ferrari has tight suspension. A Ferrari hugs the road and reacts very quickly to the road. And that's exactly what an elite sprinter has to do. An elite sprinter, when he lands on the road, on the track, he's only on that track for 100 to 150 milliseconds, even less than that. That's one-tenth of a second. So in one-tenth of a second, he or she's got to land, the muscle has to stretch, and then when they take off, they want that muscle to snap back and give them extra energy. So they want their muscles to be fairly tight, just like the suspension on a Ferrari. This person would be a lousy sprinter. This person has very compliant muscles, tendons, and ligaments. So if this person was sprinting, their muscles, tendons, and ligaments would absorb all those forces. They wouldn't get the extra forces. So what if you're just interested in jogging for health and fitness? What should you do? Well, you should consider yourself a Cadillac. Because Cadillacs have soft suspension. If you're driving a Cadillac here in Newfoundland or anywhere in Canada, and you're driving in the springtime and you hit a pothole, what does a Cadillac do? It goes, oh. <laughs> it absorbs the shock. If you're driving a Cadillac, you don't feel anything going up your back. If you're driving a pothole in a Ferrari, you feel every pothole in the road. But a Cadillac is nice and soft. And that's what you want your body to be if you're considering your joints. You want your, your muscles and tendons to absorb the forces so your, your joints are taking a lot of beating. If you're an elite athlete, then you might compromise your health for performance. Elite athletes are not always the epitome of health. If you have tighter muscles and tendons, then you've got more strain on your joints. Now, we talked before that you have about a 5% impairment of static stretching. This is the face of 5%. This gentleman here was a sprinter in the 2012 Olympics. That's the Olympics that Usain Bolt won the gold medal in 9.63 seconds. This person here was 5% slower. Do you recognize him? I don't think so. So if you don't recognize him, he probably didn't win a silver medal. He didn't win a bronze medal. So did he come in fourth place? He come in sixth place. Not even close. He didn't even come into the finals. I'll introduce you to Mr. Gerald Theory of Zambia. Mr. Gerald Theory of Zambia ran in 10.11 seconds. That's only 5% slower than Usain Bolt. He came in second last in the semifinals. He was in 15th place in the semifinals. At only 5% slower. 5% is the difference between celebrity and anonymity. And it cost this guy millions of dollars. Millions of dollars. So, are there any athletes that should be doing static stretching before their performance? Well, you'd imagine that a hockey goalie needs an extensive range of motion to do the splits and to do the butterfly. How about a gymnast? How about a figure skater? Well, even the sprinters I talked about, what they want to do is they want to get in the Goldilocks zone. So what's a Goldilocks zone? Well, Goldilocks zone is you want to have muscles that are just tight enough so they give you an efficient transfer of energy when you hit and go. But you want muscles that are just flexible enough so it doesn't impair your stride length. So how do you accomplish that? Well, in that same review that we talked about before in 2011, we looked at the duration of stretching and its effect on force. 
power. And as you can see here, it's extensive static stretching that impairs your performance. If you do static stretching that's less than about 30 seconds in duration per muscle group, then there shouldn't be any significant problem with your performance. So you can do three stretches of eight seconds each. You can do four stretches of six seconds each. Combine that with that some dynamic stretching, and you should be fine. You should be able to be in that Goldilocks zone. So what's our point? Well, our point is, 95% of you people are calories, right? You're more interested in the health of your joints and your fitness. And therefore, just like this guy who's golfing, you're not worried about that 5%. This guy, if he hits the ball 5% slower, who cares? It's not going to make any difference to his game. So if the only time that you can do stretching is before you go play golf, tennis, squash, go running, go right ahead because it's good for your health. But if you're Sid the Kid and you're the Ferrari, then what you've got to worry about is being too compliant. So you want to get in that Goldilocks zone. You want to do some dynamic stretching. But if you want to do some static stretching, you only want to do less than 30 seconds. So I want to end off with a, a quote from a famous exercise physiologist, and it goes something like this. It goes, to stretch or not to stretch? That's the question. Okay. Dr. Barron. All right, so let's talk about it. That was interesting. I need a little more perspective on static stretching. Talked a lot about muscle spindles, but maybe not to the extent that uh, Dr. Bem uh, talked about it. So you've got bag fibers, which monitor what for muscles? Their rate. Yeah, so that's how fast they stretch. And then you've got chain fibers that monitor what? Extent. So they both elicit contractions of the agonist muscle, uh, relaxation of the antagonist muscle. Uh, so what was the percentage reduction, at least in Bain's review? That's 5%. And there, there was another one noted from Australia, uh, Blazovic, uh, that was around 7.5%. So right around the same ballpark. Um, what was considered excessive? There was that dose response graph that he showed uh, that uh, looked like. Um, 90 seconds was the was the greatest, but then there was kind of some up and down, but he kind of said anything more than about 30 seconds where you'd start to get a decline in strength and power performance just prior to an event. Um, so Goldilocks zone, what is it? I don't know how he came up with that, but Goldilocks zone. So you have the optimal balance of two things. Um, these two mechanical terms came up. Stiffness versus compliance. So if you're getting ready to do a maximal sprint or a jump, you want your tendons to be uh, more stiff because you get a greater transfer of energy. So stiffness, the advantage is uh, energy transfer. So going back to the stretch shortened cycle, we're transferring strain energy into kinetic energy. That's, that's the energy transfer part of it. Um, what's a disadvantage of being having high stiffness all the time, though? Yeah, reduced range, and uh, our joints are under a lot of strain all the time. So there's a downside to that. Uh, what does the word compliance mean? If you have a material that's more compliant, what do you think of? A material that's more compliant. You can stretch it a little more. So um, 
one of the advantages you noticed with compliance was um, if we're more compliant, that doesn't interfere with our stride length. So being able to take longer strides because of being more compliant would be an advantage. What's a disadvantage of being too compliant, though? Like a Cadillac. Yeah, your, your ground contact time would be excessive and, and you'd be absorbing energy. You wouldn't be able to get that efficient transfer from, from elastic to kinetic energy as much. So, um, so any questions? So for most of us, um, well, we've got some Ferraris in here, but for all the rest of us, they're old Cadillacs. We can um, have the optimal balance. We can try to strive for that uh, Goldilocks zone to, um, for, to have good health, but also get some performance benefit in there too. Okay, all right, so let's keep going with chapter four. Anybody know who this guy is? <laughs> yes, yeah. So, 1986 NBA slam dunk champion. And at a height of five foot six, had a vertical leap of 49 inches. Uh, I think I saw a recent video of him where he's in his 40s now and he can still dunk, which is amazing. So, um, here's someone that probably has the right type of muscle fibers, um, and he's also able to efficiently transfer energy uh, during a jump. So uh, when we talk about work and energy, it's a lot like impulse and momentum. Um, so we do work on things. Uh, so we apply a force over a displacement, and that changes the energy expressed through a body or object. Okay, which is a lot like impulse momentum. Okay, so impulse was applying a net force over a period of time, and that changes the, the momentum. It usually means a change in velocity because mass doesn't change. So work and energy is a lot like uh, impulse and momentum. So we can do work to increase the energy expressed through a body or object. Just like in chapter three, where we talked about applying an impulse to increase momentum, we can uh, apply work to a body or object to increase the energy expressed. Uh, we can also do work to decrease the energy expressed through a body or object. So a lot like impulse momentum, we, when we land from a jump, we absorb impact over a period of time to bring our bodies to a stop. So work and energy and impulse momentum, it's really thinking about the same concept. Because if you're applying a net force over a period of time, that's occurring over a certain displacement. So impulse and work are, are really the kind of the same thing. So as you know, uh, work is equal to force multiplied di by displacement, and that equals a change in energy. So uh, let's take an example here. So uh, this will be on your, on your practice problems. So we'll do this together. So a pitcher exerts an average horizontal force of 100 newtons. So we'll, we'll call that the net force over the wind up on a 0.15 kilogram baseball. So ba baseballs are about five, five ounces. Um, so that's the mass is 0.15 kilograms. During delivery of a pitch, uh, his hand and the ball move through a horizontal displacement of 1.5 meters. So we can see there he's, he's doing work because we have a force and we also have a displacement. 
So right there, you've got your work during the period of force application. If the ball's horizontal velocity was zero at the start of the delivery, okay, so prior to initiating the windup, the ball has a velocity of zero, um, that's going to give it a kinetic energy of, of zero. So do you remember what kinetic energy is equal to? Yes, good. So one half mass times velocity squared is equal to kinetic energy. So we have to have some velocity to have kinetic energy. So initial kinetic energy is equal to zero. So really all, all that we've got on this side of the equation is just the final kinetic energy. So if a change in energy if a change in energy is equal to the final kinetic minus the initial kinetic, and kinetic, the initial is zero, then we've just got the final kinetic energy. One half mass, 0.15 kilograms times velocity squared. So getting back to the problem, if the ball's horizontal velocity was zero at the start of the delivery phase, how fast would the ball be going at the end of the delivery phase when the pitcher uh, releases it? So I want you to set that up on your paper. So you've got your, you've got your force and you've got your uh, displacement and then your kinetic energy final is one half mass, which is 0.15 kilograms uh, multiplied by velocity squared. So we're solving for velocity. See if you can set that problem up and then we'll go through it together. Sometimes instead of one half, I, I like to just use 0.5. 0 0.5 sometimes makes it easier. So the answer that you'll get is in uh, meters per second. Let me ask you a question. If you have velocity in squared units, how do you get it back to just velocity? Mm -hmm. yeah, you got to take the square root of whatever uh, v squared is equal to. I wonder if this will let me draw on the slide here. I bet it will. Let's see. So we've got one hundred. One point five equals. And like I said, I, I prefer just to use point five rather than one half. Grams times v squared. Okay. So then So when you work all this out, you should come up with, what did you come up with? Something like 2,000 equals V squared, is that right? You come up with that and then you're taking the square root of that. So what did you come up with uh, for your velocity? 
Converting that to miles per hour is right exactly 100 miles per hour on the release, which is yeah, just about right. 44.7 meters per second and 100 miles per hour. Do you have any questions on that one? How we did that? Okay. All right. Okay, so getting into power. Work is moving an object or body from point A to point B. That's our displacement, applying a net force uh, to move from point A to point B. So power is more important in sports because that's the rate. So we're adding a time component. So how fast we're moving from point A to point B. So, power is the rate of doing work. So, work divided by time. Okay. So, we know that work is equal to force times displacement. So, now you've got force times displacement divided by time. So, what is displacement divided by time equal to in chapter 2? Yeah, right. So, Simply, we can say power is equal to force times uh, velocity. Force times velocity. So, if we know uh, either of those variables, um, then we can solve for uh, the variable that's missing. So, if we know power and velocity, we can solve for uh, the net force. Um, so, uh, in a lot of problems, Force is simply equal to weight because that's what we're lifting. So the last lab we did uh, with the overhead press, we're lifting a certain weight overhead and we uh, looked at the velocity because that's what the tendo does is it measures velocity, but could we have estimated power like you calculated? Yeah, so you just, you solve for force by just taking the weight Kilograms multiplied by 9.81 gives you the newtons, force in newtons, and then we directly measure velocity, and then you can calculate power from that, force times velocity. So here's a curve. Uh, this is the force uh, power curve, um, showing at what force and what velocity we get maximal power. So looking at force on the x-axis and looking at velocity on the y-axis, we can look at the combination of each one that gives us the peak in power. So the take-home message from this is, is peak power happens at one-third maximal force and one-third maximal velocity. So, a little bit of each one to get maximal power. So, force is not the most important. Velocity is not the most important. They're both important to get peak power. So, what's the practical application then? So, let me ask you a question. As you, as you lift weights, and as, as you're lifting close to your one rep max, what's your velocity like when you lift a, a weight that's close to your one rep max? They're relatively slow, right? Even if your intent is to move it quickly, the weight has such great inertia that it's, it's not moving quickly. Okay, on the other hand, if the weight's really light, okay, what's your force like? Your velocity is going to be really high, but your force is going to be relatively low. So the practical application is peak power takes place at one-third maximal force and velocity. So it's to get peak power, it's usually light to moderate amounts of weight that are moved quickly.
is, is the application. So we have different characteristics that we train for. We can train muscles to, to be stronger. We can train muscles to be bigger. We can train muscles to be more fatigue resistant. And we can train muscles to be more powerful. So if you're training muscles for power, you want a combination of, of light to moderate weight to move as quickly as you, as you can move it is, is the application. So we do, do a lot of exercises with light to moderate weight that jump squats and so on that we're moving the weight quickly. So more on practical application. If we look at the force velocity curve for power, um, this curve uh, represents the velocity at each percentage of, of force output. So you can see if we're training for maximal strength, we want really high levels of force, but our velocity is going to be relatively low. And on this end, we have a very high velocity, but the relative amount of force is, is going to be relatively low. So the power emphasis, this area right here, is where we're getting the optimal combination of, of force and velocity. So you see things, uh, power is sometimes equated with speed strength. So moving, moving weight quickly. Um, our Olympic lifts and variations, um, plyometrics, loaded plyometrics. Um, out here on this end, this is our body weight, speed and agility. And then over here, this is more of the heavy weights. So we do a lot of stuff in, in this area to, to focus more on the power part. Um, as an athlete, you're probably doing stuff all the way through here at some point uh, during the course of the year. Uh, usually um, in the off season, you're doing a lot of stuff over here. And then as we, as we go through the preseason and in season and so on, we, we tend to do more stuff on this side. That's, that's a little lighter with more speed. So usually you do some of both. Um, in terms of, of power output, we want, we want to try and do things that are uh, similar or, or transfer in some way to sport. Otherwise, you know, wh why do you have athletes that are come in and spend all that time lifting and doing all those things? The, the idea is for those things to transfer. You want to transfer the things that you're doing in the weight room and conditioning and so on, you want those things to transfer to the actual sport. So there's a lot of studies that look at correlations or relationships or associations between sports skills and conditioning type exercises. So this particular study looked at the positive relationship between golf performance variables and upper body power capabilities. So there's a lot to a golf swing, especially in, the, in the, the core part of the body because that's the bridge between the legs and the arms. But there might be some, some similar things about upper body stuff that we can do in the weight room and the correlation with golf performance. So I want you to take a look here. So, how many, by the show of hands, have, have learned about correlations? So, if one variable goes up, the other variable goes up, that'd be a positive correlation. Negative correlation would mean as, as one variable goes down, the other variable goes up. So, they move in opposite directions. So, this particular study looked at positive relationships, so positive correlations. So, how many of you are golfers? Or Casually. Okay. All right. So over here we have club head velocity. Club head velocity. So that's that's how fast your driver is moving just before it contacts the ball at the at the bottom of the downswing. 
So club head velocity is, is going to be a significant factor that determines how, how far the ball, ball goes off the tee. Uh, ball velocity. So that's how fast the ball is going after contact with the club on the tee. So these are the golf performance variables. And then a couple of things that they, they looked at to correlate with golf, the ballistic bench press. What does that mean, the ballistic bench press? So you've all done bench press. What if you do it ballistically? What does that mean? You're doing it fast. A fast bench press is, is what they're talking about here. Ballistic bench press with Levi's favorite, the Wingate test, right? Okay, so how many have taken the Wingate test? So if you haven't, you will. Um, that's what we do in our department. So we torture you with all these tests. So ballistic bench press and the Wingate test correlated with club head velocity and uh, ball velocity off the tee. And so what we see is the peak power during a bench press test had a strong positive correlation with club head velocity. So at 0.64, so that means it's not perfect, but to a certain degree, as, as people were faster in their bench press, they also had higher club head velocity. So we know there's a connection there. Um, for the Wingate test, uh, the correlation was a little weaker at 0.525 over here. Um, looking at ball velocity, you can see the correlations there. So that's pretty strong ball velocity with peak power in a, in a bench press, 0.663. So that's a pretty strong relationship. Uh, and then the wind gate, it looks like right here was 0.5. So a little bit weaker, but if you go over uh, just a little bit, the relative peak power was close to 0.69 on the wind gate test with uh, club head velocity. So the whole idea is there's there's these connections between things that we're doing in the weight room and things that we're doing in the actual sport is, is the whole idea with transfer of training. Okay. All right, so back to power. So let's take a example here with a a uh, female who's won several world championships. Lydia snatched 100 kilograms. So in a snatch, the barbell is moved from a stationary position on the floor to over the athlete's head. Only 0.5 seconds elapsed from the first movement of the barbell until it was overhead, and the barbell moved through a vertical displacement of two meters. What was Lydia's power output during the lift? So we know that power is equal to work divided by time. And work is equal to what two things multiplied together. We've got force and what else? Working intensity. Uh, that's, that's power. Yeah. Displacement. Yeah. So we have mass. So how can I convert that to force? Okay, now let me, let me preface, let me back up. Power is not a vector. So what does that mean? Power is not a vector. So we don't need to define what? Direction. So to convert 100 kilograms to force, we're just multiplying by 9.81 rather than negative 9.81. So mass multiplied by 9.81 to get your force. And then to get work, you've got to multiply your force by 2 meters. And then you divide the amount of work by the time it took to do the work. So that's 0.5 seconds. So the units for power are watts. 
watts, mechanical watts. So coming up probably around early April, we have a lab on power. We get to measure how much power you produce during different lifts. The Olympic weightlifting movements are the ones where we get a lot of power. Should come up with well over 3,000 watts. That's consistent with a snatch, over 3,000 watts. What, what exactly was it again? 3924. 3,920, 3, almost 4,000 watts. Okay, more practice. In the vertical jump and reach test, John who has a mass of 80 kilograms, jumps 0.6 meters, while Sam, 110 kilograms, jumps 0.45 meters. If both jumps took one second for takeoff, which jumper was more powerful and what was the power output of each jumper? John or was it Sam and what was their power output? So again, just converting uh, their mass to a force, multiply by 9.81. And once you have the force, you multiply by the displacement. Okay, so 0.6 or 0.45. And then divide by the time, which was one second. So one joule per second is equal to one watt. This one's going to come out pretty close. You have one guy who weighs a lot and jumps. His jump was slightly less in height. We have another guy who's lighter, but jumps higher. So in terms of power, it's 400 something. What'd you get for, what'd you get for John? Yeah, what'd you get for Sam? So Sam is the more powerful jumper by just a few watts. So the reason is because he's moving a greater amount of mass. So he has more weight, even though he's not jumping as high, his jump was more powerful. So weight factors into how powerful due to the force. If each of those jumps takes place in the same amount of time. So do you have any questions on, on power, how to calculate it? Okay. So to end off this chapter, I want to talk about the relationship between force and cross-sectional area. So if we define force, in a practical sense, force can be likened to strength. So muscles create force, that force is transmitted to a tendon, pulls on an attachment point, and that results in expression of strength. Muscles, in a lot of ways, are like steel cables. You can see a cross-section of a steel can see a cross section here of a steel cable. And so this steel cable has these tinier uh, fibers, a lot the same way that a muscle has fibers that are, that are bundled together. 
So if we have a steel cable that's thicker, we would expect that steel cable to be stronger, right? So a thicker cable means a stronger cable. Thicker cable has a higher cross-sectional area. So is everybody with me that strength is proportional to proportional to cross-sectional area? As cross-sectional area goes up, think of a steel cable, strength or force should also go up. So my question is, from a geometric perspective, why are muscle size gains? And in this case, we are expressing a gain in size by an increase in circumference. So there's certain assumptions that go along with that, but as your arms get larger or your legs get larger as a result of strain training, you would, you would expect a greater circumference, right? What does that word circumference mean? So you put a tape measure on your arm, right? It's going all the way around, circumference, all the way around. So from a geometric perspective, why are muscle size gains, okay, i.e. circumference, all the way around, more difficult to achieve versus muscle strength gains? So that's cross-sectional area. Strength is proportional to cross-sectional area. Why are muscle size gains more difficult to achieve versus muscle strength gains from a geometric perspective? Not, we're not talking neurological, we're talking mechanics. Mechanics. So geometric perspective, muscle size, why are they more, why is that more difficult to achieve versus muscle strength, cross-sectional area in the arms and legs? So the next question: how do percentage gains in circumference, so percentage gains in muscle size or circumference compare with percent gains in cross-sectional area? Okay, so those are your questions. Let's take a look. Okay, so practical example. After two years training your, uh, your arms, the circumference changes from 14 inches to 17 inches. So 17 inches all the way around after two years. What were the percent increases in circumference and cross-sectional area? So, we're given the changes in circumference. So you can pretty much use the percent increase equation to look at the percent increase in circumference. So you can say, okay, the final value was 17. The initial value was... 14, okay, and then you can divide by the initial value, which was 14, and then you can multiply that by 100. So everybody do that quickly. Let's look at the percent increase in circumference or muscle size. Let's go with two decimal places. So 17 minus 14 divided by 14 times 100, so 21.43% was the percent increase in circumference. So what we're saying is if circumference is one way of expressing muscle size, we've increased muscle size 21.43% in going from 14 to 17 inches in our upper arm measurement. So we have to have some key assumptions with this. So these are the three key assumptions. How are we doing on time? Okay, we're good. All right, we're gonna we're, we'll finish up with this today. All right, I know you're tired and it's it's a hard time of year. Let's we'll get we'll get done. So so an increase in cross sectional area is proportional.
proportional to an increase in strength. So that's the first assumption. So a thicker cable is a stronger cable, just like a thicker muscle is a stronger muscle. Okay, second and third assumption. Any change in circumference is due to muscle gain, not subcutaneous fat. So we're assuming that in going from 14 to 17, it's due purely to an increase in muscle tissue rather than subcutaneous fat. Where, what, what does that word subcutaneous mean? Under skin. Yeah, under the skin. So we're talking about just the increase in muscle tissue. Third assumption is that the shape of the arm approximates a circle. In making this assumption with uh, strength and cross-sectional area. Okay, so back to the problem. So. We've done two years of really hard training and our upper arm goes from 14 inches to 17 inches. Our circumference has increased 21.43%. So we have a 21.43% increase in size. So let's calculate the cross-sectional area. So what would we predict would be the increase in strength if we're saying that cross-sectional area is Proportional to strength. So we have to look at the geometry of a circle and assuming the upper arm approximates a circle. Okay, so the first thing, what are we given? We're given circumference. Okay. Circumference is equal to 2 pi r. What is pi equal to, everybody? 3.14 is equal to pi. So tell me, can you solve for the radius in each case, given that we know circumference, and we know that circumference is equal to 2 pi r? So that's what I want you to do next. I want you to take each of these 14 inches and 17 inches and solve for the radius in each case. So in other words, divide circumference by 2 pi to solve for the radius in each case. What did you get for the radius for 14 inches? 2.23. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? The radius for 17 inches? Mm -hmm. Good, okay. 2.23, 2.71. Okay, so now can you solve for the cross-sectional area in each case? So the area of a circle we're saying that the arm approximates a circle. Can you solve for the area, knowing that area is equal to pi times the radius squared? So your answer will be in inches squared. Inches squared. Cross-sectional area, inches squared. So what's the cross-sectional area of a 14-inch arm? 15.61. Logan, you're on it today. Good. That's right. 15.61 inches squared. And solve for the cross-sectional area of a 17-inch arm.
So now can you solve for the percent increase in cross-sectional area? So it's going to be what? 23.06 minus 15.61 divided by 15.61 times 100. So your percentage increase in cross-sectional area. Something close to 40-something. 46? 47. So, 47% increase in cross-sectional area. And if we're assuming cross-sectional area is proportional to what? Strength. So if that muscle in isolation is roughly 47% stronger because it has a 47% greater cross-sectional area, a 47% increase in Strength means what percentage increase in size? What was the other one? 21%. So geometrically speaking, increases in strength will always be greater than increases in muscle size. That's how it works. So 47% increase in strength is only a 21% increase in muscle size. Do you have any questions? Yes? Is the proportion always roughly equal to 300 pounds times like the strength versus size kind of thing? Or is that just kind of arbitrary? In this example, yeah. But we, we know for certain that a strength gain always outpaces a size gain. Always. Um, that also makes sense from a neurological standpoint, too, because the nervous system uh, activates muscles at a higher level before muscles actually increase in size as well. So we can, strength is, is always comes faster than size is the take home message. Okay, so do you have any questions? Okay, so that's a, that's a good day. Uh, let's go ahead um, and start chapter five on Thursday. Let me get your sheets before we go. Thank you. And I will see you bright and early on Thursday. You two tomorrow. No laughing. Yeah, do you, how many of you have your uh, lab calculations? You can, you can take a picture or hand me those, whatever you prefer. You can take a picture and email them or hand me the hard copy. Your choice.